Welcome to the Great Humbling. What does it mean to be humbled? Perhaps it's to lose some pride, to feel less important, even a little defeated. From the Latin humus, soil, to be brought down to earth, to bite the dust, to be laid low. In that sense, maybe a humbling can never actually be welcomed in as great. We would never wish for this encounter with mortality on a planetary scale, but here we are. If this is a humbling, then maybe it's about a regrounding, a reconnection, in which we are being made to stare into the dark mirror and ruminate on the reflection we see staring back at us. Perhaps there's a message in that image. My name's Ed Gillespie, and myself and my co-host Dougal Hine have both spent the last 20 years trying to decipher and articulate that message, but in very different ways. My first love was the ocean, but as a marine biologist in the mid-90s, I quickly realised I was going to spend my whole career saying if you don't stop catching all the fish, there won't be any fish. For almost two decades, I worked as a self-proclaimed positive optimist on environmental issues, co-founding one of the world's first specialist sustainability agencies and circumnavigating the planet without ever getting on a plane. But as a champion of business transformation, I began to despair as great ideas were consistently drowned in mediocre incrementalism and I suspected I was not having the right conversations, let alone asking the right questions. Consultancy had become a cage, not a key to unlocking the future. My name's Dougald. Once upon a time, I was a BBC radio journalist, but I walked away from the newsroom and went looking for another way of telling stories, a way to talk about the depth of the mess the world is in. Climate change, the destruction of wild nature, ecological unravelling, but also the cultural unravelling that lay beneath the surface of our stories of progress. That led to the Dark Mountain Project, which started with a manifesto that I wrote with Paul Kingsnorth. I worked with hundreds of writers, thinkers and artists, publishing books and organising festivals. The New York Times introduced Dark Mountain to its readers as changing the environmental debate in Britain and the rest of Europe. But in its early years, the project also drew criticism for our willingness to look down Indeed, Ed was one of those early critics. These days, in the age of Extinction Rebellion, it seems like there's a wider recognition of the power of acting from a place beyond hope. Together, Ed and I are setting out to explore this strangest of times and perhaps begin to figure out what it means to be humbled, to make the best of being humbled, to find our way down to earth. In this first episode, we take a line from Milton Friedman that's been getting a lot of airplay in recent weeks. Only a crisis, actual or perceived, produces real change. When that crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around. So we set out to trace five key stories, five trajectories that were already lying around and that people are already drawing on to make sense of this extraordinary moment in which we find ourselves. We hope you enjoy it. We found our way into the beginnings of this conversation just as this huge event, the sort of shape and contours of which we we don't know yet fully, mm. has broken across everybody's lives. And... I think one of the things that you and I have in common is that we work a lot with stories, that we work with the kinds of stories that are a bit like maps, Mm. the stories that help us make sense of the world and find our bearings, um, help us get oriented to a world that maybe isn't the way we were told it was in... The official stories, the stories that shaped our growing up and our um, maybe the expectations we headed out into life with. And I feel like I've been I've been in that role as a, a cultural storyteller working with crisis and change and loss and disorientation for a long time. And in the last couple of weeks, I had the strangest experience for about Mm. 10 days i lost all my lust for telling stories i felt like a gut level disgust at the (laughs) the activity that has been at the heart of a lot of my work and it felt like it's too soon Mm. to Mm. tell the story of this event that we're in the middle of 
and there is a kind of um, proliferation of of narration going on and of sense making and all of that but actually a lot of it someone said to me earlier it's like wily e. coyote when he's run <laughs> off the cliff and his legs are, are spinning in the air he hasn't yet realized so he's not yet falling and then sort of after this 10 day period in which the only thing i really wanted to do was have quiet conversations that were very gentle mm. one that started with oh how are you doing yeah <laughs> which can open up a, all kinds of different things at this moment uh, and after trying to listen suddenly the second part of this thing came to me and this little voice said it's too soon to tell the story mm. and it will still be too soon to tell the story when it starts to be too late yeah yeah <sighs> So that feels like you know, this kind of paradox that we're stepping through in putting anything down on on tape or uh, whatever the digital equivalent of tape is at this moment. And the temptation, isn't it, is always there to sort of try and rush in, as you say, and try and make sense of these things. I think, you know, if we look back, uh, I'm immediately brought to mind when you describe that as, you know, you think of the other major sort of crises or world changing and shaping events in the last 10 or 20 years. And, you know, I'm immediately brought to like 9-11, you know, and the very in, almost instantaneous war on terror, you know, idea and narrative which emerged from that, which is obviously manipulative, simplistic, wrongheaded, um, and actually quite devious in some ways. And then you look at the like 2008 financial crisis where, you know, the story that comes in there is, you know, that it's overspending of government <laughs> that has somehow led us into this sort of recklessness rather than the casino uh, aspects of financial services. So whilst I think I, I think it really connects with me when you say if if you leave it too long, it will already be too late. So we have to start to try and explore what the narrative options are here. Um, and there was something that you said to me this morning, you know, where it's like these stories are sitting around us like coils of rope. You know, we are mm. all entangled and interwoven in these different stories and narratives. Um, and the temptation, you know, instantly in terms of wanting to do something, um, is to tug on one, is to just grab, you know, and start pulling uh, at that story to see if that's the if that's the right connection. And um, I think we've got to be a bit cautious about that because we'll end up with the coils tightening around us, perhaps with the wrong story. Uh, and instead, we need to make the most of perhaps these moments in just looking at how the stories are lying around us and and enmeshing us if you like uh and then start to follow the threads which might loosen those bonds and allow a more flexible and fluid exploration of the ideas yeah so for for me us being here doing this at this moment it's like a halfway house yeah i'm used to writing these considered pieces of sense making and storytelling mm. in this public voice and that voice doesn't feel right just now no. but it also doesn't feel possible to just sit and wait until it's time because there probably isn't going to be a time when it does make sense to start mm. again we we have to kind of feel and fumble and puzzle our way into this together so yeah, I guess yeah. that's what we're doing <laughs> yeah <laughs> i know it, it, exactly exactly and it and it i think one of the ways that you've described it um before in terms of sort of mapping lava i think is is really opposite here isn't it because as you say it's a rapidly changing terrain it's still potentially quite treacherous underfoot yeah it is it's like trying to redraw the map of a landscape in the wake of a volcanic eruption, mm. while the lava is still flowing, and often the best thing to do is just to state the paradox up front mm. rather than seem like 
you're not aware of it. Yeah. But the the sort of starting point that um, I shared with you is this kind of back of an envelope map mm. of five of the stories that are in play, these kind of narrative trajectories for what the far side of this event might look like. You know, where are we headed mm. um, through and after whatever we end up calling and thinking of this COVID-19 pandemic and all of its knock-on effects, whatever we end up calling that event. I think that if we sort of maybe just talk our way through these five stories, Mm. that will also land us in the territory that you and I were talking about in this conversation that we've been having that has then coincided with this sudden big event, which is this conversation about the idea of the humbling. Just to frame that before we dive into the actual stories themselves, is that is that notion of apocalypse, you know, is that kind of put, putting that front and centre because that's what it can often feel like to people. And I think it's worth clarifying, you know, the origins of that that word. The notion of apocalypse is literally revelation, as drawing back the veil. You know, it's not Armageddon. It may be the end of a world, but not the world. It is about seeing things as they really are. Um, and perhaps in that revealing, you know, there is a a refeeling of the way. And and Mm. I think that's really important. And so maybe what we're doing here is looking at these narratives which are actually being uncovered by Mm. the moment that we're in. Because I think it's it's true that each of these narratives that we've got on this back of an envelope map was there already Mm. in one form or another. It's the relationship between them that is changed. And in some ways, they become more visible because of the rupture, yeah. the interruption of business as usual. So that's actually, you know, that's the first of these stories is the back to normal <laughs> story. Yeah. You know, it's uh, <sighs> this default. It'll all be over by Christmas. Ah, yeah. Yes. Where have we heard that one before? Yeah. And, oh, we'll, yes, yes, it's going to be this very sharp downturn, but we'll come roaring back, yeah. as various um, political leaders have said. And, you know, obviously, at one level, it's the default position of power. Mm. It's the position of existing institutions and players and those who were winning or had most to lose before normality was interrupted. But it's probably important to notice as well the way that that meshes with something more widespread and quite understandable. Mm. There's a kind of longing, you know, imagine how good it'll feel when all this is over and you can have a drink with your mates in your favourite pub again. Yeah. And who doesn't feel some version of that in a moment like this? It's also very seductive, isn't it? I mean, you know, it's it's consoling. You know, I think, again, it's that sort of knee-jerk reaction. It's like, you know, you, you can see it in the way that people are panic working, you know, almost like retreating into productivity, um, you know, filling their online diaries in the same way that they filled their, their real diaries with coffee m- meetings and chats. Uh, and suddenly it's back-to-back Zoom and people are going, oh, my God, I'm basically online for 10 hours a day. And I think... That comes from that loss of identity that people are feeling, you know, like job, status, value, role, all of those things start to sort of come into question, um, which, which means we're, we're seeking a distraction. You know, we're, that, that, that need for distraction is like going, there must be a way back to what we had before. You know, there must be a way that I can reconnect. I want to hug my, my family and my friends again. You know, as you say, I want to be in the pub. Um, and, and in some ways, work saves us from actually asking the really difficult questions because we just go back into that busyness. Absolutely. And I mean, I think there's a sort of, there's a, there's a cynical version of this back to normal story as well, or at least a kind of eloquently pessimistic one, which is, um, well, it was, it was put, 
very nicely by my old friend Paul Kingsnorth, who I started <laughs> the Dark Mountain project with. And he says, yeah, this civilization will not learn anything from this virus, he writes. <laughs> All this civilization wants to do is to get back to normal. Normal yeah. is cheap flights and cheap yeah. lattes. Normal is Chinese girls sewing our T-shirts under armed guard. Normal is biblical bushfires and barrels of oil. And I, I read that the other day and um, I really feel it as a, as a kind of reaction against all of these kind of quick mm. um, stories about, you know, how we're going to turn this into a moment of transformation and, yeah, how, how, how we're going to learn from um, this encounter. And I also wonder what what kind of existence a civilization has this civilized what does this civilization want yeah. i don't know if i'm persuaded that civilizations are entities that exist and have desire and volition in mm. quite that way can you can you interview a civilization <laughs> <laughs> to find out what it wants <laughs> yeah and and then i had the thought as as President Trump kind of pivoted a few days ago towards this thing of, you know, the cure can't be allowed to be worse than the disease. We have to mm. get back to work after these 15 days and so on. I thought one of the places that that is coming from is a fear amongst mm. those who have most vested in things mm. getting back to normal, that the longer the interruption lasts, the more people are likely to question mm. the yeah. normal to which yeah. we would be getting back. And that, you know, at some level, that is where the kind of um, the urgency of getting mm. America back to work um, you know, getting things roaring back. That's part of where that mm. comes from, I think. Well, and fear is, is terrible like that, isn't it? I mean, I think, you know, when we're fearful, we, we make terrible decisions. <laughs> um, you know, and I think there, the point you're making there taps into this, again, the self isolation piece is the fear of self, you know, that somehow being alone and undistracted is actually a scary thing. And we know that from the practice of wilderness vigils and rites of passage and initiations, but also this fear of others, you know, the very thing that we're being made to be fearful of contact with others. Uh, and that fear, I think, is 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 quite problematic, uh, which one of the reasons why, you know, you can't allow it to push us into despair. And at the same time, you know, the angle that, that you were describing coming from Paul almost reinforces a sort of Kubler-Ross five stages of grief type of approach to uh, our loss and our longing. You know, the denial, anger, bargaining, depression and acceptance, which is not a linear process. It's, you know, it's it's different phases which pop up at different times. But you can see that manifest in, in terms of what people feel like they're losing at the moment. It's like, you know, the back to normal story is denial and anger incarnate. Uh, you know, mm. and, and leading into bargaining. It's like going, this can't be happening. You know, this can't be happening to me. This can't be happening to us. Um, and so therefore, a return to normality must be possible. Um, and, you know, you don't want to sort of lurch into that depression um, stage, which can it can equally be problematic if you end up the dwelling there. But in some sense, that letting go, that acceptance or embracing of uncertainty, because I think... There's a lot of duplicitousness going on at the moment in terms of what the duration is. As you say, Trump says 15 days. Uh, you know, we, we joke about it being all over by Christmas. Other people have said Easter. Boris Johnson has said 12 weeks. You know, the, the fact of the matter is you don't know. And mm -hmm. so to a certain extent, we have to have an embracing of uh, uncertainty because the more we are holding up false promises or false deadlines or false timetables to people, uh, the the more worrying it becomes. Mm. Absolutely. And I, I think a part of this resistance for telling any one strong story of how it is at mm. the moment for me has just been 
hearing hearing people tell a story and going, wow, you know, that's changed a lot from how the world looked to you 10 mm. days ago. Yeah. How is the world going to look in another 10 days? <laughs> and I don't know. Yeah. I, you know, we'll see. And that not knowing is really important, isn't it? I mean, you know, I, I, I did a workshop six weeks ago with the Bank of England on, you know, nonlinear risk. Um, mm-hmm. And the three things we were trying to sort of, and this was in the context of climate change off the back of the Australian bushfires. It was basically saying, you know, what happens when you get simple, linear, predictable trends combining through tipping points to give nonlinear, chaotic, exponential, uncontrollable outcomes? Um, you know, and you can pretty much see that uh, in the pandemic as well. And actually in the way, and the way that different governments have or haven't reacted to simple, linear, predictable trends, i.e. testing, you know, lockdowns, all of these kind of things. And then you see the exponential, um, chaotic, uh, effects of, of spread. And I think, the three principles that we were trying to get people to understand then was like, we really don't know what's going on. We have to embrace the unknown unknowns, which is this uncertainty piece. We're not in control, which is that egotistical, hubristic uh, idea that, you know, we've got this all, we've got this people, you know. Um, and, and thirdly, that perhaps, and most importantly, the models of our leadership in terms of the heroic leader are probably are probably very wrong. And whilst we might need some foresight as to where we might want to go, I think leadership in this time is as much about holding, like we're trying to do with this particular narrative space, holding that space uh, in a way which feels safe for people without without lurching to the wrong conclusions too quickly. I'm really curious, Ed. So this was six weeks ago that you were having that workshop with yeah. the Bank of England. And obviously that there was a particular frame and themes of the workshop. Did the coronavirus come up at all in your conversations that day? Uh, no, it didn't. Um, but it, where it did, because we, 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 we were essentially talking about the risks of the tales of the distribution. You know, so the things that happen, uh, like the Australian bushfires, you know, which are in the 5%, but when they happen, they're devastating. Um, and ironically, I think there was a graph that was put up by the Committee on Climate Change, which, along with extreme climate events, did have pandemics and not coronavirus specifically, but had pandemics and economic crises there. So you would put. I, so it was yeah, there. It was there. But, I, we, you know, but it, I think it's just it's worth pinning yeah. how quickly this has emerged from a thing that was just in the corner of our yeah. Uh, yes. as, oh yeah, well, an, another strange new disease somewhere in Asia. Yeah. To a oh, an event that calls everything into question. You know, mm. of all of these kind of stories that we're we're sort of mapping out here, the back to normal story is the story that has changed the most. Yeah. From six weeks ago, because six weeks ago it wasn't a back to normal story; it was normal. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So, exactly. so then the, the, the next story, as we kind of work our way through these, and these kind of overlap and it's not like one of these is going to be right. And it's not like they are simply um, detached observations and attempts to predict because they're also entangled with each other in terms of pulling the directions that things go in. But, but the next story is the story of the new normal. Mm. Yeah. And there, there are various versions of this in play. And you know, a lot of it starts with, well, who are the winners of this crisis so far? Amazon, Facebook, Zoom, supermarket yeah. delivery services, <laughs> yeah. um, surveillance. So this is kind of the story about how what we've got is a fast forward mm. into a new normal that is probably you know, more tightly coupled to and dependent on big platforms and digitalization and automation mm. and, you know, a decline of the high street that had been kind of going on gradually gets suddenly fast forwarded. And yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I, and it's, and, and I think, you know, Yuval Hari wrote about that in the Financial Times the other week, didn't he? When he said, you know, there's rapid acceleration towards potential surveillance capitalism, um, which comes from that. And, you know, and I think in that sense, that new normal narrative runs into problems because, you know, many of the business models, whilst ruthlessly effective, were leaving a trail of carnage in their wake. So business was in many ways broken before this particular crisis. And this ultra capitalist, slightly plutocratic, rentier type of economy is actually quite fragile and extremist. You know, it's like it's still dependent on the bullshit jobs. You know, actually, um, unfortunately, a lot of the jobs that are involved in those uh, those large organisations are still bullshit jobs. And I think, as you say, you, you know, there's a sort of slightly dystopian acceleration of that new normal. And I, I, But I did want to also counteract that with, I think, you know, some of some of the articulation of that new normal um, is hopeful and positive. You know, I think actually what you start to see... Um, some of the, you know, the smaller businesses reacting very, very swiftly and very radically. So one of the things that I've been impressed by in London is like the way that new Covent Garden market traders that previously supplied hotels and restaurants with fruit and veg, you know, were very quickly able, once their business pretty much disappeared overnight, to repurpose themselves for doing domestic deliveries. And I thought... That was impressive. You know, they obviously, I think pretty much they had no choice. But I think those type of uh, businesses which have been able to step in and provide what is actually a public service in complementary fashion to the existing supermarket delivery services has been quite heartening. You know, that's that sort of radical new localization, which is also possible. So it sits in awkward, in awkward, in awkwardness alongside that you know, ultra capitalist uh, you know, centralised um, megacorp. Absolutely. It feels like there are sort of utopian and dystopian versions of this yeah. story available. And part of the story is a kind of platform story where you have, yes, the kind of um, the agile kind of micro businesses sitting on top of the mega platforms. And you know, one way of mapping the, the kind of utopian versus the dystopian version of it is simply about the ownership of the platforms yeah. and the kind of political struggles, which you know, which actually kind of comes into the next phase in this mapping of stories. But there's there's another level to it as well. So you know, I think there's a there's a real kind of curiosity that I've heard from various places about how far people will want to go back to the old norms mm. when it comes to um, you know, flying around the world for business meetings, but equally yeah. you know, going off to study on another continent. Does that become, do our personal evaluations of whether or not we want to find ourselves you know, a continent away from our family and the people we love and care about. Yeah. Do those come into play such that we find ourselves in a very different world on the far side of this event? And it's like there are differences possible within that which might not matter when you look at it <laughs> through one lens and might matter a lot when you look at it through another. So, yeah. you know, in some ways, from a sort of very straight sustainability lens, it doesn't matter that much yeah. if the the not flying translates into uh, people having vast numbers of Zoom meetings or translates into a, a more radical relocalization in which it's not just that we've virtualized our long distance relationships, but we've actually shifted the balance on the far side of this once we're allowed out again and got more involved with the places that we find ourselves in now yeah. uh, for me the difference between those two things maybe they don't have that much difference in terms of their carbon footprints they have a huge difference in terms of the desirability of the world that you find yourself mm. Mm. in and that feels like that's all kind of in play within this space of yeah what the new normal might be on the far side of this. So I agree with you. It's really, it's complex and tangled that one. Yeah. And it's, it's been really relevant for me because I was writing a report for a large uh, European city on the future of transformative travel, uh, which I started writing um, at the beginning of March <laughs> uh, and was due to be submitted last week. 
Um, and obviously, as you can imagine, the world somewhat changed. And it was interesting writing a report about the future of tourism when there were absolutely no tourists anywhere in the world, pretty much. Um, and the notion of that new normal then becomes quite fascinating because, you know, this is not about rebuilding business as usual. You know, literally the house has burnt to the ground. There is nothing left of this house. Um, and so do you, in that context, rebuild exactly the same house you had before? You know, and I think, you know, fundamentally, of course you don't. You know, you try and build a house of your dreams. And so I think the the new normal for, for that industry in particular will play to the points that you were just making. It's like, what is what is tourism um, as a as a as a resource, not an outcome? You know, well, this is not about numbers anymore. This is not going to be about a numbers game. There will always be that that force which wants to drive the numbers uh, and get the numbers up and get the occupancy rates of hotels up. But actually, there is something there about if transformation is what we want globally, then how do we use tourism to drive the transformation we need, which might actually be a lot of this relocalization. And the other thing that um, struck me when you were just saying that as well was, um, and this is going back to a conversation you and I had yesterday, where it's like when going back to normal actually looks less attractive. And, you know, and a, and a slightly flippant example, you know, there's a there's a pre-work clubbing event uh, in London called Morning Gloryville, you know, where everyone comes together uh, and goes for a kind of pre-work rave, for better or for worse, you know, fruit juices, well-being, uh, dance your way into the day, 7 till 9 a.m. kind of thing. Um, and I've never actually been to the real life version, but yet on Sunday this week, I joined the online version with nearly a thousand people. Um, and it really struck me that this was an improvement, actually, in many ways, because it was truly global. There were people from all over the world participating. There was no constraint to participation. It didn't matter if you were mobility impaired, you know, or you literally just woken up. There was no logistical challenge to get into Old Street or wherever the kind of the neutral venue of aggregation was going to be. But also there was an incredible intimacy and authenticity of being welcomed into everyone's living rooms or even bedrooms, you know, because you were essentially watching all these people dance um, in their own homes. And, and, and for me, that sense of connection was was truly global and actually quite beautiful and quite profound in a way that all of us gathering in one neutral space would not have been the same. Um, and, I, and I wondered in my reflection afterwards going, will people actually want to do the the live event in the same way, having had a, such a rich experience from the event that was supposed to be a, a poor shadow of its previous incarnation. So I guess, you know, we've been talking about some of the um, desirable and undesirable things that emerge through what fills the gap during yeah. this interruption. And kind of the, the next story that I want to go to, I guess comes out of something that it's important to acknowledge, which is just how hard this is hitting people. Yeah. And, you know, at every level through society, this sudden onrush of precarity and of you know the foundations of people's lives being pulled away almost overnight. And I've seen you know, people in really desperate mm. um, situations that were kind of unimaginable to them a few weeks ago. Um, and one of the things that emerges from that is this narrative that I'm kind of calling disaster communism. Um, I, uh, it seems like kind of communism has been brought back as a meme that it's okay to, to use rather than just as a name for a terrible thing that we must never go back to in recent years. Uh, you can think of that what you will. Um, but Obviously, there's, there is this, there's this expression, disaster capitalism, mm. that was coined by Naomi Klein in her book, mm. The Shock Doctrine, in 2006, where you know, she tells, amongst other things, the, the stories of um, you know, the real looting that followed Hurricane Katrina, which is not the thing that the media um, you know, kind of imagined into being of desperate poor people looting um, New Orleans, it was people who are now deeply involved with Trump's White House who were organizing the kind of industrial scale financial looting um, of public assets in that moment. Mm. And there's a great 
teaching that Naomi did last week with her publisher and a couple of other authors who are with the same publisher. You can see that online. We'll put that in the show notes where she's talking about, you know, noticing the moves that are already being made yeah. of this kind of disaster capitalism play within the way that the US version of the um, the, the coronavirus bailout, if you like, is being assembled. But there is also this story, the sort of disaster communism story, about how this event is driving a sudden shift, mm. adoption of things, policies that belonged right at the sort of leftward end yeah. of the spectrum of political possibility. <laughs> the Ovator window has definitely moved. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's like it, it's it's no longer a, a, a window, is it? It's just kind of... Uh, it's gone al fresco. They've just, they've just removed the entire glass. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so... You know, versions of universal basic income mm. being advocated and things that have certain resemblances to that being instituted as short term emergency projects, um, homeless people being housed en yeah. masse in yeah. properties that would otherwise be sitting empty. Talk about a national food service as there is a need to to get beyond simply the supermarkets filling the infrastructure um space that is yeah. created by the crisis paul mason in his newsletter the waves on the 17th of march was writing by the end of the month there'll only be two kinds of people in british politics reluctant socialists and enthusiastic ones <laughs> yeah <laughs> i know i know but and, it, and it's that triumph of possibility isn't it i mean it's like Suddenly, having been told, you know, through a decade of austerity that there is no magic money tree. Um, and then we have this sort of magician's act where, you know, the best part of half a trillion pounds is suddenly made manifest, uh, which 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 begs the question, you know, why this stuff isn't solvable in a conventional sense. Because, as you say, if you can overnight um, pretty much put all the homeless people in the country up in a hotel and we have empty properties all over the uh, the country. If you can find the mechanisms of propping up people's income um, to ensure that you keep the liquidity in the economy going, then actually UBI starts to look quite appealing. I saw a piece this morning as well from Matthew Dancona asking what the point of the Labour Party was when the Tories were essentially bloke flirting with UBI. <laughs> it's like, you know, as you say, they're, they're, they've, they've picked up ideas which were lying around uh, because this now feels right uh, and it feels appropriate. And this is, again, this sense of the longer it goes on, the more trouble the people who have most vested in the back to normal narrative mm. are in. Yeah. And you know, actually, that's one of the places where we're dealing with the unknown, well, the known unknowns that we, you know, we know that we don't know yet yeah. uh, how... Um, how long it's going to be necessary to have the kinds of lockdown that we have at the moment. And we don't even have consistency between the way different countries are applying them. You know, I'm yeah. sitting here in Sweden where actually we don't have <laughs> lockdown no. at the moment. <laughs> Yet. <laughs> it doesn't, you know, it doesn't actually feel terribly comfortable as someone who doesn't have the inborn confidence in um, the Swedish mm. experts that people who are born in Sweden rather than having wandered into Sweden like me tend to have but um you know there's, there's so much so one of the factors in the way that these different narratives and the trajectories these narratives trace play out is going to be just at the level mm. of the things we don't yet know about the yeah. pandemic itself yeah. but i think there's also you know in some ways the stronger the disaster communism narrative is like the longer this goes on and the more um um, the more of a radical transformation is born out of necessity in this crisis. There's also, uh, I suspect, going to be a kind of tension between the sort of statist and mutualist mm. dynamics within this, you know, between the extent to which what we create is, you know, big, powerful new platforms of support from above and the extent to which mm. uh, what we create is improvised um, human scale um, webs of mutual aid, yeah. and both of those are kind of kicking in in different ways at the moment. And you can and you can see and you can see that, can't you? I think you know if you take, I mean, that sense of solidarity 
and like beyond, you know, the back to normal, new normal perpetuation of a sort of individualistic, slightly kind of selfish, self-interested commercial and consumerist culture to suddenly having this idea of, you know, genuine solidarity with frontline health workers um, who have, you know, taken a battering in many ways uh, in recent years and, you know, poorly paid, understaffed, the whole kind of the Brexit layer of, you know, internationalism within the NHS uh, and and cutting off the supply of key workers. Um, uh, and also on the, the flip side of that mutualism, you know, the half a million people who step up to volunteer to support the health service. And I think, you know, there is a real line in the sand potentially being drawn there where people going, no, you know, there is such a thing as society. We are actually in this particular context very, very sharply all in this together. Um, and that. Well, here is your big society. Yeah, here is your big but, society. Yeah. But the price is the price of your big society is it's a your bailout economy. in which you underwrite uh, the. Um, the economic security of ordinary people rather than a exactly. bailout that just you know, yeah. reflates markets for bankers. And I think um, that's, and that's the key thing here, isn't it? It's like, how do we, how do we capture the, 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 the welfare of the precariat? How do we protect those people? How are they, rather than being repeatedly hung out to dry, which is what tends to happen in these types of crises, in the gig economy and zero hours contracts and all of those people who are literally clinging on by their fingernails, because uh, even the government bailout that's been suggested here for the self-employed, you know, is is massively rigged to favour the people who are actually doing okay. You know, yeah. if if you're only earning 200, 200 quid a week, then you're only going to be compensated for that 200 quid a week. Whereas if you were earning 50 grand a year, you'll be compensated for that. And I think, you know, even that is is not, is being done to perpetuate an inequality, which was a problem before the crisis. So, I mean, the, this kind of the disaster communism narrative is a kind of is something emerging pragmatically Mm. Um, but also being framed as a narrative politically as well. But there, there are sort of other narratives of disruptive progress that are kind of gathering around the edges of this, that kind of see, um, see an event like this as a dangerous moment, but one that could also kind of herald humanity's Ascent to a new mm. level or something, and I mean, I um, yeah, you look at some of the thinkers around rebel wisdom, yeah, for example, people like Jordan Hall and Daniel Schmachtenberger. You've got these very smart guys, uh, very alert to existential threats, and they've you know, been talking for years about the ways that things like a, a pandemic can. You know, disrupt the, the the sort of the precarity of the systems of our societies and so on, and they're drawing on all kinds of interesting material. Not least, there's a, an emphasis on the mythopoetic mm. um, at, that that kind of taps into some of the same sources that you and I have been mm. um, drawing a lot from in our work. But what I see, kind of below the surface and sometimes coming to the surface within that kind of school, if you like, is this core framing of utopia or bust. You know, that the the 21st century is about either humanity is going to go extinct or we will achieve the Star Trek future. We will step up to this kind of new level of collective consciousness, like the social version of moving from single-celled to multicellular life forms. Mm. That, you know, there's this kind of big evolutionary story where evolution is not just what it means in um, in kind of natural science terms, but it's got, it's taken on this kind of religious quality to it as this kind of grand arc moving through history. Um, and I guess I, I find, I mean, I find that really interesting mm. as a as a a scene a phenomenon you know, different versions of that you see popping up in different places 
It can be a bit binary though, can't it? I mean, I, and I say that as someone who's sort of guiltily played with that in the past, you know, the sort of like, is it going to be Mad Max or Star Trek? You know, uh, and as if there is nothing really in between. And I think that plays to that sort of heroic journey, doesn't it? It's like going, well, it's going to be, you know, total victory or abject defeat. Um, and it sort of occludes the very, very messy middle ground, um, mm-hmm. which, you know, is not necessarily going to be about, um, polarity. And actually, if, if you, if you play it as that zero sum game, I think you're inevitably setting yourself up for some quite serious disappointment. And what's interesting is that, you know, the messy middle ground is not much to do with you know, either back to normal or forward to a mm. new normal. It's, you know, really is um, a, a longer trajectory of unravelling. Yeah. Of, um, you know, where this is a major event within a larger um a larger story of the converging crises mm. of the times that we're living in which is you know, which again takes us back to actually what you and i have kind of crossed paths around and the, mm. the things we've been working with and the questions we've been asking yeah. But I, but in that sense, the disruptive progress for me, you know, does play to this idea of, you know, which is a sort of a bit encapsulation or a microcosm of life in general, which is the horror and the beauty, <laughs> and, and and maybe maybe the disruptive progress narrative is that one where it's a bit like a midlife crisis, you know. Uh, I heard a psychiatrist refer to it the other day as the break that could make us whole, and so. You know, the positive spin on the disruptive progress would be, you know, you reveal the dysfunction of the ailing system. You know, uh, we've, we've, going, going back to that pulling back of the veil, you go, ah, okay. So there are some problems here, but it does then also suggest that it's just a mechanistic fix, that a little bit of a tweak here or an adjustment there. Um, which, which always brings me back to, you know, my slight departure from the world of sustainability because, I was just was constantly haunted by this idea of like, well, what are we sustaining? Yeah. You know, which goes back to the new normal, you know, and back to back to normal is like, well, what are what are we trying to per- like perpetuate here? Keeping what going is the bit that like almost killed consultancy for me uh, and made it very difficult for me to go back into a room authentically and work on mediocre incrementalism. And this is pre. COVID-19, you know, this was in the context of the, you know, the trashing of biodiversity and the web of life and climate change. But, you know, I, I couldn't go back in there because I didn't feel I was in service to sustaining the right stuff that mattered. Mm. And I guess for me, like the, the, the breaking point for me with the, the disruptive progress stories is the, the big concept, the high concept of progress that stands still at the yeah. center of them this single line running through mm. history yeah. and you know i think the, the kind of the heart of the sort of schmachtenberger hall version of this is this idea of a civilizational reboot yeah 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 <laughs> and i i'm not really interested no. in uh in rebooting civilization and back to actually the, the the question that i had about that line from paul's lovely essay where um he's talking about what this civilization wants it's like um i, I kind of feel like a civilization is a story yeah in the way that paul and i talked about when we wrote the dark mountain manifesto actually um and so what's needed now is more a story of well, actually, yeah, this is kind of, this is the fifth story I had on the list, which is softening the fall. Yeah. A story of trying to, you know, contribute to and use the things that are going on, including things that belong to each of those four narratives that we've already placed on this map to greater and lesser extents, but with an awareness of, you know, the historical patterns of rise and fall of civilizations mm. and that, oh, the history of that is quite complex. Yeah. The, the fall of civilizations both has an inevitability to it and also 
know, plays out at ground level mm. in ways that are hard to pass through a cost benefit analysis because it depends yeah. a lot on who you are and where you <laughs> well, stand yeah no completely i mean and, and as i say i have to hold my hand up on the kind of narrative of progress because you know years ago i gave a tedx talk which was called sustainability the reinvention of progress <laughs> so you know how is that going oh uh, yeah exactly i was a subscriber to that um i, I think you know my good, good friend john elkington describes it quite beautifully he says it's very difficult to recognize a paradigm shift when you're in the middle of it um, which sort of plays to your point of this softening of the fall. And I think that's, that's the idea of, of the right stories being, being a bridge, you know, bring, mm. not being, uh, a crutch, you know, in the same way that, um, back to normal or new normal might be. Uh, and it's not about that technical, uh, hardware association that you just touched on, you know, the kind of the reboot, the reset, you know, which makes it sound like, well, we just turn, I turn everything on and off again, um, you know, and everything will be fine. Where it, it is a much more emotive and emotional, I think, reimagining, rethinking and refeeling. And I, I particularly like the way you described it is as the sort of fig leaves of our stories, you know, mm. where we're sort of, we're clutching at them to cover our, our naked modesty. Um, well, it's like this, this virus comes along and it's like God coming walking in the garden in the evening <laughs> in Genesis chapter three. And, you know, we're suddenly aware of our nakedness. We've had this encounter mm. with knowledge and mortality and we clutch, you know, we pick up whichever story we were carrying already um, and use it to, to cover ourselves, to cover our modesty. And, you know, this is, this is the kind of, um, the, 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 thing that it's necessary to be honest about in what you and I are doing here because you know we too have stories mm. that we've been carrying and that seem to us to have something to say to the moment we're in and that seem to be in some relationship with the processes of sense making that are called for mm. and there is also well I certainly feel a kind of an appropriate hesitancy to um, to not try and have or pretend to have all of the answers either. No, I mean again, it's that rush to solutionising, isn't it? Um, it's like, yeah, there must be there must be an answer. Like, that's also the consultancy mindset that I still have to occasionally police. I listen and I listen to. Um, I listened to a conversation the other day with Erwin James, uh, who you might be familiar with. He's a Guardian columnist, but um, he was a former prisoner. He got a life sentence, a convicted murderer, um, you know, and was actually given a 99-year sentence, I think served 20 years, a lot of it in isolation. Um, and one of his bits of advice was, you know, these types of moments when one door closes, um, another one does open, you know, in the cliched sense. You can either take it as resignation um, or opportunity. Um, but he said, in terms of not rushing in, he said, use the time. Don't let the time lose you, use you. Mm. And actually, one of the critical things was to slow your thinking, was to yeah. actually was to be able to take that breath, to take that pause, um, to have that consideration. Um, because otherwise, you know, you can, you can flip yourselves into very different, difficult moments, um, with the ropes tightening in, in around, around your neck, perhaps, <laughs> rather than, it's, yeah. It's what Bio Akumalafe says, isn't it? Uh, the times are urgent. We yes. must slow down. Yeah. Yeah. And Isabel Stengish has a lovely passage as well about, um, you know, the need to to resist the mobilization that can be a response to mm. yeah to a thing like climate change that you know, part of what we're being invited into by an encounter like the one that is playing out at the moment is to notice the gap between the things we're trying to do and the ways we happen to have been doing them mm. around here lately. And lots of that is suddenly very 
visible, potentially at least. You know, the gap between the things we're trying to do when it comes to food and feeding ourselves and the way we happen to have been doing that around mm. here lately. The gap between the things we're trying to do with education and learning and the way we happen to have been doing that mm. around here in recent generations is thrown really sharply into relief for lots of people when they're suddenly, you know, the kids are no longer going to school, they're in the home, everyone's together trying to figure out how to make this work. And there are going to be lots of other layers of that. And so I guess you know, my hope for what we could do with this podcast over the episodes to come mm. is that we pick up on different aspects within these stories we've been mapping out today. Um, and in particular, the way that this kind of last story that we've touched on of the kind of softening the fall, the being brought down to earth, mm. as, you know, Bio Kamalafe and Bruno Latour both talk about that, um, that we can kind of bring that together with some of the questions that are potentially being asked of us by the strange experiences that lots of people are being thrust into in this you know, difficult, painful yeah. time, which is going to be full of lots of loss of different kinds. You know, there are lots of lives and livelihoods that are in mm. jeopardy right now. But that maybe you and I, as we continue to explore this, this idea of the humbling, of being yeah. humbled, brought down to earth, maybe there's something in that that fits with the space of not rushing yeah. into, but just paying attention to the yeah. moment and I, that we're in. Yeah, and, and, and I think, yeah, we're both agreed on that in the sense that, you know, articulating this is not easy. Um, you know, this is, this is, we've both been working on articulating these kind of challenges for a very long time. Um, and I, I just listened to something this morning by our good mutual friend, Martin Shaw, who said, uh, no great story begins with business as usual, <laughs> which I thought, <laughs> which, which is just like, which is pretty much it. Uh, and he, you know, he sort of goes on to say, bad storytellers, um, make spells, but great storytelling breaks them. And I think, Partly the exploration that I'm interested that I've already valued having with you is how do we break the enchantment of the stories which have perhaps bewitched us, uh, but which haven't served us um, and haven't served the wider planet. And I think particularly in that sense of the the collective, as you say, the horror and the beauty of the the, the death in which we find ourselves at the moment, and yet the new potential at the same time. There is always this darkness and light to both of these to both sides of this story uh, and we have to be cognizant and, and conscious of, of both of those yeah so let's see if we can take all of this as it plays out and make it amongst other things a much needed breaking of the spell beautiful thank you for listening to The Great Humbling these are astonishing times to be living in. Apocalyptic in that sense that Ed brought up in this first episode, times in which many things are revealed, uncovered, brought into a new light. We see this podcast as very much an exploration, not a prescription, a provisional investigation that maybe loves questions more than answers to begin with and needs a little time and space to breathe. There's a great German word, Fingerspitzengefühle, literally fingertip feeling, the way we might gently sense our way through the dark of a lightless, unfamiliar room. This is an unscripted and hopefully courageous and heartfelt conversation, a wandering, if you will. And as Tolkien said, not all those who wander are lost. We plan this as a series of informal and roving conversations as we all adventure into uncharted internal and external territories. For us, daring to dream beyond the current urgency does not dismiss or disrespect it. Rather, it honours it. Whether we like it or not, our futures are already being decided today. Please do comment, ask questions and respond. 
You can find us on Facebook at The Great Humbling. This is initiation at a cultural scale. Please come and join us on this emergent journey.